Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where tonight we're going to be talking about pressures and coaching. And it's uh, something that affects all of us, whether or not we have kids in school, maybe we used to have kids in school. There's a lot of research that shows that kids who are in athletics do really well after high school. They do well in their life. They do well in decision making. There's just so many positive things about having kids in athletics. But the whole athletic environment and the whole environment of coaching is changing so drastically. It's putting a lot of pressure on the people who go into coaching. In fact, the Minneapolis Star and Tribune did a, a, about a two-section article on um, the pressures in coaching here just recently, and there were some interesting statistics that they threw out. 10% of girls' uh, coaches, I believe hockey coaches, no, 10% of the football coaches re quit every year, or retire every year. 18% of girls' hockey coaches quit every year. And in the 2016-2017 year, 71 coaches resigned their positions from coaching across the state of Minnesota. Those are pretty stark statistics. And so today we're going to be talking about what these pressures are and what is it that coaches are dealing with today that they didn't have to deal with 15, 20 years ago. And my guest to my right is Gary Gruy, who is a, a longtime friend and who's been a coach for a long time, an athlete, played at the college level, played at high school level, done, has done a lot of different things, and he'll mm -hmm. give it a little bit of his background. And then Stephanie Hansen, who is a star player, maybe. I will say that, but she <laughs> has an interesting, very interesting background. And Stephanie works now in Park Rapids, and she is a volleyball coach coming off a disappointing loss to a chance to get into the state tournaments. But Welcome, welcome to the show, both Thank of you. you. Thanks for having us. Gary, maybe we could start with you and you could give us some of your background. Oh, well, let's see. I uh, grew up in Deer Creek, Minnesota, a small town by Wadena, and uh, went on to college at Brainerd Community College where I played three sports. Um, mainly went to college at Brainerd, basically, obviously to get an education, but mainly to play sports. Uh, back then, that's three sports. You don't play three sports, even at the high school level, much anymore. Uh, I went on to coach at uh, Sabika, Staples, um, Park Rapids, Bemidji, and I finished up in Pequot Lakes. Uh, 25 years as head boys basketball coach. We had uh, quite a bit of success at Pequot Lakes. Um, some dang good kids and some good people I worked with, some assistants. Um, got out of coaching about, uh, this will be my fifth year out of the head boys basketball position. Um, found out I was spending more time with other people's kids than my own kids. Um, my wife and I have a set of twi or twins, a boy and a girl that are now seven years old, and that uh, eats up a lot of my time. Um, I found out that uh, coaching took up too much time. I was spending more, too much time away from my own kids. I do miss it. Uh, I miss uh, being a, a head coach, and now I'm currently the J junior varsity coach. Uh, I spent a couple years coaching seventh and eighth grade and, and after I got out also. And you had pretty good levels of success. You had three teams that were in the state tournament in basketball. Yeah, we, had, we were blessed with <laughs> some good kids and uh, some good set of parents, good administrative help. Uh, wonderful assistants. Um, uh, we hardly ever changed assistants. The, the 11 years I was there between Brett Serge and Brian Lempola, uh, Kyle Spray and uh, John Dale helped out there for a few years. Uh, but you, you, I, well, somebody told me one time, you surround yourself with good people and they make you look good. And that's pretty much what happened at Pequot Lakes. And um, when you got out of coaching, like you said, for a couple of years, you really did miss it, didn't you? Oh, yes, definitely. I missed the competitive spirit. I missed the camaraderie with the kids. Yeah. Um, you really miss that, and, and the competitive nature of the game. But I found out it was just taking too much, t too much of my time. Sure. And after I got out, I didn't realize how much time it actually took. Mm -hmm. And I go, my goodness sakes, how did I actually do all this mm -hmm. and spend time with my family beforehand? Uh, it and, was very and I noticeable. Think, I think it's something important to point out, too, that no one coaches for the money. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No one not. coaches. And we'll talk a little bit about what people are paid. But yes. it's not a lot of money when you look at November, December, January, February, and March yeah. in basketball. Uh, all of these sports it takes a lot of time. Yes. S Stephanie, let's talk a little bit about your background, if you would. Yes, um, I actually grew up in northern Minnesota, up 
in Carlstead, uh, way up in the northeast corner. And yeah. Um, but yeah, I uh, of course was a three sport athlete yeah. as well, um, basketball and volleyball and track, and very involved actually with a lot of things. Um, anything I could be involved in, I was as a as a student athlete. Um, but I played college volleyball at NDSU and also had the chance to transfer and play with the same coach in Texas at the University of Texas in Arlington. So, and then I chose to coach as well after I had my kids. And, and so how long were you at Texas? One year then? Two. Two years at Texas? Yep. <laughs> and then I actually lived in Texas for about um, seven, eight, eight years and um, we decided to move back to Minnesota um, just for our kids and get, get Kind of the way I grew up in in the, in the small town and um, mm -hmm. just a safe environment for my kids to grow up in, and so been here ever since. And um, I, I coached my daughter through her career in volleyball, and she went on to play college volleyball as well. And, and did um, quite well. Yeah, she she did very well. She won two national championships at the University of Con Concordia um, in St. Paul. So um, very well. She was the, on the seventh team that won the straight title, seventh straight title national at nationals. Cool. So um, just really fun to be a part of all that. Never thought I'd probably coach again, but had two nieces that in Park Rapids um, and started with them on their off season. And then the coach resigned and then I took over and, and this is my 15th year. So I'm four years going now in coaching volleyball in Park Rapids. And volleyball has gotten to be really a big thing in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of that credit goes to not only the teams like Concordia, but University of Minnesota has had a phenomenal yes. program for a number of years. And I know it's not unusual to see that place packed now when they have their exactly. volleyball games. So it wasn't that long ago that not that many people went to the University of Minnesota volleyball games. So it's good to see that, that women are getting the recognition and girls mm -hmm. are getting the mm -hmm. opportunities to play in those sports that probably wasn't that big. I, I don't think we had volleyball when I was a kid growing up. Right. For, well, girls didn't have anything but being a cheerleader at that time. Yeah, it so has grown it immensely. Really has. And, and I, I don't know the exact statistic, but volleyball in Minnesota is, they're one of the top in the country as far as um, participation, mm -hmm. for sure. So now besides being a coach, you also teach. Yes. And what is it that you teach? Um, Currently, I, I do have my master's in education and, and have an elementary degree, but I'm currently a teacher for deaf, hard of hearing uh, for a co-op in Bemidji for Brick. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you travel to other school yes. districts and work with kids in other school districts. Yes. It's and a low, ins yeah. low incidence, so not okay. a lot of this, you know, there's maybe one or two in each school. Um, so technically, they're not going to mm -hmm. hire a, a full-time right. teacher, so yes, mm -hmm. and I'm, yeah. I'm kind of the... The itinerant that goes around. And hey Gary, what grade are you teaching? I teach now? sixth grade language arts, and so I've taught for what now, 35 years. I'm 56 years old, so I can retire. At you didn't have point. to tell how old you were. Yeah, but that's you look right. much younger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I married well. That's one of my key success. <laughs> well, so you both have very rich backgrounds yes. in coaching, yeah. and, and you've been around a long time, Gary. You've been around since the 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. when the coaching was very much different than oh, it is today. Much so. And the article that the Star Tribune did focused primarily on the metro area. Correct. And, and I think you guys want to talk about maybe the rural area to start right. with, and maybe we could talk a little bit mm -hmm. about the pressures of the clubs and the AAUs in the metro area, but maybe we could get to that if we have time later. What, what's, what's happening from your perspective uh, that's creating the pressure on coaches where so many of them are just saying hey, it's not worth it. Well, I think a big problem that we have in the coaching ranks is that you don't see the, the longevity of coaches anymore. And um, if you're a young coach, say, if I was like 23, 24, I'm not going to probably make it to 30 as a head coach. And uh, sometimes it, part of it is that kid, uh, coaches uh, get in as, into a head position um, too young of an age. But of course, there's an opening there mm -hmm. and there's nobody else that wants to take them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of the stuff uh, has been our summer programs and the keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. If you're going to be successful, you have to put time into the summer. And, uh, you know, I think that one of the biggest changes when the high school league started to allow coaches to work with um, their athletes in June and July. And basically, I remember the last uh, 10, 15 years or whatever, uh, when that program, um, when that initiative came in, uh, basically, the only month that I ever got off from basketball pretty much was August and part of September. 
Otherwise, you know, when you, you're preparing for the season, then there's the season of basketball, then there's April and May getting ready for the summer, then June and July, okay? You're spending time, not with your var just your varsity, if you wanna run a good program, you as a head coach, you're also del delving down into the fourth, fifth, even the elementary, lower than that. Uh, that takes time. And uh, I think that really weighs on young, co young coaches um, uh, with, uh, as far as their commitment to their families. And, and obviously you're not going to get paid for this. And you don't get paid much even if you do get paid some. And usually that's through community ed or something yes, different. Uh, yeah, it? it's, I don't think I hardly ever talk hardly anyone to maybe so much money for the gas or something like that mm -hmm. in the summer. Because it's costly enough for the kids the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to keep it low cost. I hardly ever charge very much for our camps. But still, when you think about your camp, uh, then you take gas money for tournaments. These kids have to eat. Sometimes there were overnight things things start to add up and then it's the investment of time we live in a lakes area kids when do they have time to go fishing or uh, to do whatever else it is that they want to do as a mm -hmm. kid or with their families and that not only for the kids and their parents but also for that coach and i think fewer and fewer coaches want to spend that much investment stephanie did you play basketball too i did and and so you played bas basketball volleyball and what was your third sport you track. said were track mm -hmm. so when you had your summers as a student, where was the uh, the pull? Where was the biggest pull for you? Was it volleyball or was right. it basketball or what was you know, it as it, a student? It's, it's interesting you ask that because I think that's so different mm -hmm. now because of the opportunities that are out there in the summer, especially with volleyball, because our off season is in, you know, it, well, it, it actually starts winter um, right away when the season's done. But I really don't remember ever really taking a, an interest in volleyball being my top sport until I was a junior in, in, in high school. I, I, I loved all the sports <coughs> mm -hmm. and I did everything. Um, but nowadays I just think girls, especially volleyball athletes, are, are picking volleyball ahead at an early age and then quitting their other Even sports and, grade, and right? yep yeah. and because the opportunity right. is a year round and, and I'm not I don't want to take away from that opportunity because it's it's needed right to again to keep yep. up with the Joneses yep, that's right <laughs> you know yep. but um but I do feel like they're they're not getting the value of the, of all the sports and um, they're, and they're seeing different coaches too yes you know and I I've always thought too is that some of these basketball players, if they just play basketball, that's all they would see is me mm -hmm. and then my style of coaching. Yes. And I always thought it was very beneficial for them to have a football coach, a cross country mm -hmm. coach, or someone else, to, a baseball, someone else to compare to where they get different experiences in life. Everybody brings something different to exactly. the table and those kids will benefit from that. I mean, practices, I love it when yes. they say, oh, I coach so-and-so said this and you know, exactly. certain things stick in their minds and it makes a difference for yeah. sure. And it's so beneficial coming from someone else and not just you all the time. Right. <laughs> and you, you do start to recognize talent pretty young, don't mm -hmm. you, in, oh, yeah. in the sports that you're seeing. So when you see a talented girl, mm -hmm. um, are they starting to feel some pressure about being good enough to go on to college at the high school level? For sure, yeah. I think, you know, though it, it depends. You know, those pressures mm -hmm. can come from a coach for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I tend to try to be a more balanced uh, coach and I, I try to give the, you know, the athlete the, a bigger picture and, and give them a chance to kind of see what is gonna be best for them, but they might get, be getting mm -hmm. the pressure at home right. with, with parents going. You know, or, or peers or on peers, social, especially yeah, on or social their best media. Friend or social media is where a lot of those interactions. Uh, say, um, Billy over here, he's playing on this AAU team, and he asks Sam over here on my team to play with them. Yeah, and then one thing kind of leads to another. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So that social media has changed the environment oh, for yes. coaching, exactly. hasn't yeah. it? In what ways? How is that affecting coaches? You want to go with that one first? Well, you're you're I, younger on this. Yeah. I, okay, so the Instagram, and yeah. I mean, there's so many things now that they can show the videos and they can get information out there and, mm -hmm. and they can, I know our Park Rapids uh, you know, team had an Instagram page and, and so did the tennis team yeah. and I was able to be tech, uh, tech enough to kind of, you know, go into those different pages and it was almost like this battle of popularity and <laughs> yeah. you know and it's just a constant pressure I think for 
I don't know, these adolescents to be popular and to be well, they can cool. Go, and they can go get drills. They yep. can go get information on camps. They can mm -hmm. get information on tournaments, some in-state, some out-of-state. Uh, what's Johnny? They, they get together with people from other towns, and all of a sudden, then they're all of a sudden, they're being taken out of your community yes. or away from your local coaches sometimes. I'm not saying that's a bad right. thing, and, but mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. There's more pressure then because everybody else is kind of doing it and that they find out that through that that social media mm -hmm. and they know everybody yeah, they know everybody. <laughs> every kid knows every other kid it's yes. insane yeah. that was one of the things that the star <clears throat> tribune uh, reported about was some of these elite camps mm -hmm. were telling the kids come to our camp we do a better job in the mm -hmm. summer oh, yeah. than your high school coach correct which has created a whole different stress less uh, level especially i think in the metro area I'm sure you see some of that at your level too. Yeah. There are camps that you send your kids to, and one of the concerns uh, in the years, a few years ago, I know, was that AAU kinds of events sometimes kids were getting bad habits. Yes, but, yes, and no. I think there's a place for AAU, and I think that there's a lot of good AAU coaches. And let's maybe yeah. explain what AAU is for um, people who don't know. It's a higher level of uh, basketball, volleyball. I'm assuming also mm -hmm, correct. Mm -hmm outside the regular high school season. It usually takes place in uh, April, May. It, sometimes it goes in the fall league. There's fall league basketball. Um, it's where kids will go to gain one um, better skill set uh, to play more basketball, number two, uh, through, through these programs and to get exposure for college, um, for college coaching. Um, and you have a tryout. And tryouts and so, so on. So you're put on a, a level, a skill level mm -hmm. of team that, you know, are, are they regulated by the Minnesota State High School League? No, not a bit. So they're completely free to yep. kind of operate as they like. Correct. And there's a lot of good coaches out there. And yes. There's a lot of good programs. So sure. I'm not here to bash AAU right. by any stretch of the imagination. Right. I always had good, uh, good rapport with a lot of the AA coaches. Uh, some are better than others, and they run a better program. Some, I think, but AAU parents have to, and players have to understand, there's more time commitment for certain programs as opposed to others. And I think they... As parents and as athletes, you have to kind of find your niche yes. in the AAU program. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes um, kids have an expectation when they do play AAU that that's automatically going to make them a better high school player mm -hmm. and going to guarantee them a spot, a spot. on the varsity mm -hmm. team or X amount of minutes playing time. That's where things kind of come in. And but I, I would guess that parents also have some expectations from sure that. Sure, they do. Sure, they do. It's a, it's it's also it's cost, time, mm -hmm. and time away from family. So they're, they're investing. They're investing. If we're investing all this money, we want more playing time. Yep. Or they think they should. And in some cases, you know, uh, majority of the people that I worked with, that wasn't a problem. But I think it's getting. Uh, I think it's more of a problem towards the metro area, mm -hmm. Definitely. because it's a little more cost. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had pretty good rapport with the people up here uh, that I've worked with through the AA programs. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I guess what I was going to say is there's different levels, but they're all right. opportunities. Correct. And you kind of have to look at the child yes. or the kid um, and say, what, what, what is this kid looking to do? What are their goals? And what um, kind of AAU situation would be, would be good for them? Is it the high level, best skilled team in the state? Or is it just local tournaments? Or is it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in in a college where they want to go? You know, and that can start as young as believe it or not, yes. second grade. Really? Yeah. Well, I was just talking to a parent. Wow. I'm not going to get into names, but whatever their their son was invited to um, um, play in a specialized uh, hockey situation. I was going to say, I bet it was hockey. Yeah, down in the cities, <laughs> and uh, the parent, you know, is probably going to say no because hey, it, it's it's too much time away from home, away from school. Now, granted, there's parents that might, might want to choose to do that, but I think that's where parents have to come in and say, enough's enough, or this is right, or we need to do more. I mean, there has to be, and there, there has to be communication with the high school coach and the parents and the player to figure out where that would yes. be best for them. Mm -hmm. As coaches, how did you handle parent complaints? Or how do you handle parent complaints? Do you prefer face-to-face -face meetings? Because I, I know, that one of the things that's starting to ha happen, <clears throat> excuse me, through social media, is there are more parents communicating with their coaches through email, maybe saying things that they maybe wouldn't say face to face. Mm -hmm. Have you? How do you handle that? 
Um, to be honest, in, in, in Pequot Lakes, I had very little uh, parental issues. Not that there weren't parents talked at me. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, and, but that's the nature that's of the beast. Also, that comes with part of the job. I sure. mean, you're going to get some of that. Yeah. But I had the majority, and I mean the majority of the parents I worked with in Pequot Lakes were very, very, very cooperative. Not that they always liked what I did or whatever, but the, the players and the parents were very supportive of what we tried to run as a program. I think what really helped me is that I had stability in my coaching mm -hmm. staff. I had uh, the same ninth grade coach. I had two different, uh, three different uh, varsity uh, assistants, uh, but I, and one was only there for a short year, but I had on both ends uh, some good quality people. My seventh grade coach was there the whole time. Uh, majority eighth grade coach was there. I, I changed very few coaches. Um, the thing is that what happened is there was an expectation as people moved up the, pro, the ranks and so on, um, that there was, um, this is what needs to be done. This is what needs to be done. This is what's expected. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my lower level coaches took out, took care of some of those problems before they got to me. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, most of my issues, you know, uh, would come up with our youth basketball, with the youth basketball program uh, at the beginning of the programs. Uh -huh. uh, when they didn't know the expectations that were designed into the program or what were the expectations as, a, as their son moved forward. Um, I think that's huge. You know, go ahead. The youth I would say the same thing. Well, the expectation piece yes. throughout the whole program. Right. It just clarifies a lot of things right off the bat. Right. And when, you know, the kids come up, especially, you know, at the varsity level, they already know the expectations and there's no questions. Right. There, there was one boss of basketball in our, in our town. We had different entities. We had the PAC program. We had uh, the community ed program and the high school program and then the summer program. And, you know, I advised the youth programs and I ran the high school and the summer programs. You know, but there has to be one set of expectations from the head coach on down, mm -hmm. which means you have to have administrative support in order to have those expectations. And I had that also. I'm not asking about yeah. personal salaries here, but yeah. In general, what kind of <laughs> salaries are our head coaches made? And let's just say in basketball and volleyball. You if you look kind of across central Minnesota, what, what ranges do you hear of? Or, and I know it's negotiated by teacher yes, contracts correct. for everybody, but what, what, what are you looking at for salaries now for people in your field? Did you get 4800 No. I think I was like as low as 32 at one time. $3,200. And, and I think I was at Bemidji, I probably got close to a little over five. Wow. I had to start yeah. over again yeah. in Park Rapids. So I had to start to at the, the low yeah. because, you know, wow. yeah. The salary doesn't, I never coach for the salary. Yeah. No, I mean, but I think it's important yes. for people to understand that people oh, I get don't what go saying. into coaching to, because it's no. paying well. No. It's uh, when you look at the hours, I used to say when you volunteered, you made it about the same amount of money as a head coach because <laughs> yes. you all put in about the same amount of yeah. hours and you don't, it doesn't come yeah, out Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did it because I loved it. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, seriously. And I think the metro area is paying higher oh, yes, than definitely. it does here. And Brainerd pays, Brainerd here and Brainerd pays much higher. They're a bigger school. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know? Uh, you, you, I would assume you both belong to the coaching associations. Yes. Does your coaching associations provide any support for the challenges that young coaches are dealing with now? Uh, well, you know what they provide is they provide people to talk to. You know, if, if, when you're around long enough, you have you develop friendship. And if there's an issue, I wouldn't hesitate to call right. Dave Galovich and Crosby. I wouldn't hesitate uh, Dave Cressup and Perham. Um, I know some other coaches that here's the problem we have that I'm dealing with uh, as far as whatever it may be. And I'll, I'll network mm -hmm. and especially go into coaches clinics in the summer. Mm -hmm. You see people you have an adult beverage after the game or not after the game, but in the summer after uh, things are over and then you talk about it, the certain problems you might have and you work towards solving them in, in your own way. Mm -hmm, definitely. Coaches clinics are really fun oh, to go to. Coaches clinics are huge. The networking, you know, they always say, yeah. I guess I've always said volleyball is a small world. I mean, yes, exactly. It really does too. help. To yeah. So that network of, this, and I'm thinking about this for maybe people who are looking at the program who might want to get into coaching. Mm -hmm. Networking with experienced people would be a real big deal. I it? strongly well, believe that. It goes back to what you said. If you're a young coach and you want to you mm -hmm. have a career in it, you know, be an assistant with, with, with the coach that is very experienced and kind of learn and grow. Yes. And, you know, I'm looking at, at becoming, you know, the end of my career too here soon. But, you know, I've, there's been expressed, you know, interest in, in some coaches coming under me. And I just think that's great. Um, 
I think that would benefit yes, them a I ton because there's so much more to coaching. Find, than just, find a mentor. Yes. Find someone to help you to bounce ideas, whether they're actually they're currently coaching or even if they're not coaching. But then actually then listen to them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you have to do it you know, mm -hmm. exactly the way because you still have to be your own person. And I think you need to find, and the schools have to help with this, the schools need to hire more coaches. I mean, they're, they're teachers and coaches. If you're a good teacher, you're probably going to be a good coach. If you're a good coach, you're probably going to be a good teacher. The schools need to hire more coaches so there's more people to get into the coaching that are in the school. I think that would be good. You have a mentorship. Uh, you find some people to bounce ideas off. Uh, and then surround yourself with, with good people. Mm -hmm. You really have to do that up and down the program. Uh, that makes it makes a head coach's assistant, even in the summer, which takes a lot of time. If you have assistants to help you in the summer, and I was really lucky that I had, uh, especially in Pequot Lakes, it makes a ton of difference mm -hmm. as far as hey, I can get, put them over there, they'll take care of it, I know they'll do a good job. Right. So in your two particular areas, uh, Pequot and uh, Park Rapids, are you having good uh, numbers? Are, are you getting lots of kids out for volleyball, and lots of kids out for basketball? Are those numbers looking good? Go ahead. It's interesting you bring that up because no, it has been, that has been really, really tough. Even um, though you've had a really <laughs> good season, exactly. seasons, mm -hmm. really? Yeah, we, you know, and I, I always, you know, you think, oh, what am I doing yeah, wrong? Yeah. You know, they're not coming out for volleyball, but it is basically all the sports in Park Rapids yeah. right now. It, they're having a hard time getting kids come And come I know out. some of the Metro football teams have mm -hmm. almost not enough kids to have scrimmages. Yeah. Maybe because of the concussion issue, but that wouldn't be your issues in volleyball or The Pequot basketball. Lakes boys side, it seems to be, we have <coughs> doing a pretty well. good participation. I think overall our girls do too. Um, I think we've had a lot of success in both the girls and the boys sides of, you know, variety of sports. And I think, you know, people are, it's that a helps. sports town and people mm -hmm. talk sports and they, the, the way the kids go out. And we have good youth programs too. And it, it's amazing because when you <clears throat> have successful sports teams, that gets all around the state. Yeah. Yes. And it, it has a positive impact in the community. Yeah, very much so. A positive impact with the kids. Yes. And uh, I see kids 30 years ago that played at Staples and they oh, still yeah. talk about the heyday. It's just a great experience. Mm -hmm. So I hope when the young people watch you guys today, you've been very positive in oh, yes. talking about how to get in, not, not how to get into coaching, but the positive things about coaching. I think it's really important information you give about building a network uh -huh. of experienced people. Yep. And I, I am out of time, ah. but thank you both for appearing on the show. And if they want to get in touch with you, they I guess they could do that through your school district, yeah, Gary they, through Pequot Lakes, yep, Stephanie we have a through yeah. Park, 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 Park Rapids. Rapids. Volleyball .com, so. well, great. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the show and sharing some really good information. Thanks, 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 thanks Steph, for coming, thanks and thanks for, for having us, us. Ray. You bet. Appreciate it. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.